In this lesson, we're going to talk about the idea of contraction and index gymnastics. Call it index gymnastics. That's sort of the phrase that's used in the classical discussion of the subject, just to understand how things are done when you do things the other way, but the way that I'm not describing, not teaching, when you consider tensors to be their components, like a, mu, nu, when you think of that item as the tensor instead of a, mu, nu, e, mu, tensor product, e, nu, for example, where you add this basis vector, um, we think of index gymnastics as the technique to keep track of the indices on these tensorial objects that are really the components of full tensors. So we'll talk about those two subjects today. Contraction is the harder one um, because it's very easy to execute and do, but it's a little bit of a bear to understand why it's so important. So we'll begin with that. So I'll start by reminding you that a tensor, which I'll say I'll call my tensor, say A, a tensor A, and let's imagine that A is an element of the 3, 2. How about that? The 3, 2 tensor product space. And so we know that A can be written as A uh, alpha, beta, gamma, mu, nu, E alpha tensor product, E beta tensor product, E gamma tensor product, E mu tensor product, E nu. And this is an Einstein sum, and it's got one component for every one of the basis vectors. This guy here is a basis vector of the the three the rank three two tensor product space, and this is the component for the rank that particular tensor or the components of that particular tensor. So I'll use this as sort of an example. So if this was a PQ rank tensor, then P equals three and Q equals two, and we have a three two rank tensor. And um, remember that convention exists where the vector arguments or the vector part of the tensor comes first and the covector part of the tensor comes second. So this is a map that takes covectors and vectors to get real numbers. So A is a map from the dual space, oops, the dual space Cartesian, the dual space Cartesian, the dual space Cartesian, the vector space Cartesian, the vector space, to the real numbers, right? So that's what A is. A is a map from ordered pairs of covectors. When my covectors, I'll go with omega, or I'll, I'll, I'll try to use like omega to be covectors. So the first covector the second covector, the third covector, and then V will be my vectors, the first vector and the second vector. So there's an ordered uh, quintuple, quintuplet of vectors and covectors which belong to this space, and that gets mapped to the real numbers by the map A, which is an A is an element of T3, 2. If you think this is overkill, I, I always like, you know, look, there's multiple ways of writing this down. A is a map from this space to here, or this thing is an element of the domain, and A will take that to the real numbers. So, now, um, but it is important to start thinking about A not only as a map to the real numbers, but it could be a map to another bunch of vector spaces, right? A could also be a map that takes V star, right, to a certain vector space, right, just V star. Here, I've written down A, A will take an argument, a, a quintuplet argument, and give you a real number. But if I don't have a whole quintuplet argument, I can still give A a single argument and get a map to some other vector space. I can't get all the way to the real numbers, but I can get to some other vector space. And what vector space would that be? Well, there's three that immediately come to mind, right? The first is, so, well, let me, let me do it, start this way. If I think of it this way, I'm going to think of A as a machine that takes uh, uh, vector, 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 covector, covector. So how do I make these slots look different? How about I put a, a, a semicolon here? 
So all these first ones in front of the semicolon. I don't like semicolons. I don't like semicolons. Hold on. Um, how about I make colons instead? All right, so this will be a colon. Vector, 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 colon, covector, covector, right? Um, the problem is I only need two covectors, so it should look like that, okay? So vectors go here and covectors go here. All right. Um, so that, that's the machine, right? That's the object. This is the uh, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler method of looking at things. A is a machine that takes three vectors and two covectors and gives you a real number. But now, if I fill that machine with one covector, in other words, I write A, say, um, omega, right? Maybe then, and I leave the others blank, right? I do omega, and I need another thing like that, and then I leave like that, right? That, that is an object that is waiting for a vector, a vector, a covector, and a covector, right? And then if I gave this thing, this thing, a vector, vector, some unknown, unspecified vector, vector, covector, covector, I would get a real number. So this thing here is a map that takes two vectors and two covectors and gives a real number. So that thing is an element of a rank 2-2 two -two tensor product space. And if I could do this all day long, right, I could feed omega 1 into the first slot and omega 2 into the second slot, leave the third slot blank, and leave the last two slots blank. And now I have a map that's waiting for one vector and two covectors, right? And I could think of this as... Um, I could fill the second slot, right? Like that. Uh, let me erase that. I could fill the second slot like that, leave the first and third slots blank, leave the two covector slots blank, and that is still an object that's waiting for a vector, a vector, a covector, and a covector. So that's also an element of the 2 2 phase. Now, this, these, there are two different elements, right? I found two different ways to take this object A and create a map into the 2 2 tensor product space. So that's a tensor product space. These are all tensor product spaces. Tensor product spaces are vector spaces. So when I write down A is a map that takes an element from this um, from from this Cartesian product space to R, I can also say, you know what? A is op A um, A uh, omega right? A omega, that is a map that takes, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just do the shorthand version. It takes this to R. Ah, oh, wait a minute, well, that's not right. What, what am I saying? A dot omega is a map that takes V star Cartesian product V star um, Cartesian product, Cartesian product, it takes that to R, right? And that's this A here could be this one or it could be this one. It could be, I mean, the way the way this A is defined is, is, is it's got two problems. First of all, I have to pick an omega, right? In this case, I picked omega. Here I picked omega 2. For, I mean, just a different vector, right? I picked a vector, I put it in the first slot. Picked an arbitrary vector and put it in the second slot. This thing here depends on the arbitrary vector I pick, right? But this thing is ambiguous. It could be this or it could be that, right? It's, it's unclear. So this is not an unambiguous symbol. There's multiple ways of making such a map. Um, in other words, knowing the tensor A and the vector omega does not uniquely specify a 2, 2 tensor. It could be it, at least there's three different versions I can immediately think of. Anyway, my point is is that um, when we have a tensor A, we've defined it in the concept of these maps to R, but we have to understand that it can also be, be maps to other tensor product spaces. A, um, 
uh, if I fill, you know, A can be a map from, in this context, A omega is a map from here to R, but, but, uh, putting uh, omega in A takes a map from A to A omega. So this operation here, this thing, that's a map from, whoops, from T3, um, 2 to the tensor product space 2, 2, right? And, um, and so the point is, is you can think of these tensors as a variety of different possible maps, right? Um, you know, if, if I, uh, I can say V cross V goes to um, tensor product space 1, 2. You know, A is a map that takes two vectors and gives me a tensor in 1, 2. And of course, I could do that by putting omega 1, omega 2, blank, blank. And this thing is an element of T1, 2. So we can make maps from Cartesian product spaces to a variety of vector spaces. In this case, I've exemplified tensor product spaces. So that's an important thing to understand. But then what's important is, say I have some map from V cross V, oops, V dual, where I have, say, P of those and Q of those, and it's going to some other vector space U, right? Say I have that map. Some, some map, I'll call it Z, because my the book I learned this from called it Z. This is a map that takes something from this Cartesian product space, this Cartesian product space, um, V dual, like that, and it gives me an element of some vector space. Not It could be R. R is a vector space, dimension one vector space, so it could be R, but it doesn't have to be R. But say I have such a map. Well, there is a principle, a principle of, and it's linear, that's another important point. Everything's got to be linear here. Let me remind you, linear makes all of this possible, linearity. So we have a linear map from this set to this set. And linear in this context means if I hold one, uh, if I hold everything constant here, but I just like start playing around with one of the vectors, as I change the component of that one vector, this will change in a linear way. Um, and uh, so uh, that, that's what we mean by, by linear, right? If you hold everything constant, everything is linear in each one of these. It's actually not linear. The, linear is the wrong word. It's multilinear, right? Multilinear is the right word for this. It's linear in every one of these um, uh, slots. So I hold everything constant and I change this. This changes linearly. Meaning if I take this vector and multiply it by the number A, this, whatever result of this is, this gets multiplied by the number A. If I take this one and I multiply it by the number A, this gets multiplied by the number A. Likewise, this one by the number A, this gets multiplied by the number A. So, um, uh, so it's multilinear. It's linear in every slot. In fact, this whole theory is really the theory of multilinear maps, right? A tensor is a multilinear map. Okay. So, with that in mind, um, there's an important property of tensor product spaces. And it says that if such a map like that exists, you are guaranteed, guaranteed, that a map that goes from the tensor product space like this. to you also exists, also exists, and these maps are the same map, meaning meaning I take whatever, uh, sequ whatever vector, whatever element I take from this Cartesian product, if I take that element, that's an ordered set of vectors and covectors, if I take that ordered set and I produce this tensor product in that same order, I can find a map that is called C that takes that object and goes to you which is a map from T, P, Q to, this, to U, and it's the same map. So the way I might write this is this way. 
let me think, let me write, find some notation here. Um, what did I say I was going to do? Uh, w for, W with a superscript for vectors and V with a subscript, no, no, W with a superscript for covectors and V with it. So, say I took an element of, that was V1, V2, V3, W1, W2. That's a Cartesian uh, product space, right? So the element, um, that element would be V1, V2, V3, W1, W2. It's this ordered quintuplet, um, which is, uh, uh, it's an ordered quintuplet, and it's an element of, well, I guess I should write down the set. It's an element of this set. <clears throat> v, 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 V star, V star, right? So this is an element of that. So I'm taking my map Z on that thing. I know that there is a map, well, I shouldn't say define. Uh, there is a map C that acts on V1, tensor product, V2, tensor product, V3, tensor product, W1, tensor product, W2. And these maps are the same. I mean, they give you the same number or the same vector which is an element of u on both sides right so the the element of u on this side equals the element of u on that side so i know that that map exists and um that's called the universal property um i'm not absolutely sure why it's called the universal property but it's called the universal property so it's telling me that whenever I find such a map like this, I know that there's a map like this. And I can actually prove that that map exists by building it. By the way, as, as a quick reminder, this symbol here, what this thing means, you know, V1, I'm calling a vector. So V1 is an element of the vector space, V, right? And therefore, it must be expressible as A mu E mu, right? And V2 is a different element of V, and it might be expressed as B nu E nu. Um, and because it's a dummy index, I could really have written this mu mu. It doesn't matter if you repeat these dummy indices as long as it's clear what's summing over what. Um, uh, probably best not to, though. I mean, that's probably not a good idea. That's probably not a good idea. So we'll say B nu E nu. And W1, likewise, is an element of V Likewise, an element of E-dual, so that would be, say, C, uh, C, eta, E, eta, like that. Um, in, in keeping with sort of notational convention, if I'm really naming my vector V sub 1, right, if, that, if, if I'm calling it V sub 1, I probably should do something like V sub 1 mu E mu. Right? The problem is, is then you start, this starts getting weird. It's like, I'm naming my vector with a subscript, but that's not a space time, that's not a, a, a vector index. This is the vector index, right? This is the vector space index. So that's a little messy. So if I renamed the coefficient from, you know, V1 to A, then I get this thing. So I hope that's not too confusing. I, I think that's, it's good if, if you're going to talk about vectors in general, then it's important to have a notation like this so you can quickly lay down a whole bunch of vectors from V and a whole bunch of vectors from V star without trying to come up with new letters. You know, V, W, X, and then I could say alpha, beta. A lot of books do that. They'll use Roman letters for the vectors and, and Greek letters for the covectors. That's fine, too. It's just I, I, I run out of uh, letters, vectors, and covectors. I run out of Greek letters pretty quick in my head. And then there's the letters from the beginning of the Roman al alphabet and letters from the end, and that gets confu confusing. But this is called the universal property. Now, the, uh, the universal property, it's important to sort of understand why it is um, significant. But let me just first mention that if I take... Uh, uh, 
if I can prove this all for a simple tensor, right, then it's going to be true for all tensors because of linearity, right? So a simple tensor can always be, can be expressed in the in the form v1 tensor product v2 tensor product tensor product v, uh, w1 tensor product w or I guess this would go to vp and this would go to wq, right? So if I can just take a single string of vector, tensor product vector, tensor product vector, and I can, and I can write it just like that, then I've got a simple tensor. Um, and uh, if you can prove, since basis vectors are simple tensors, right? E1 tensor product, E3 tensor product, E0 tensor product, E1 tensor product, E3, say, that's a simple tensor, right? Because it's just one collection of vectors. Each one happens to be a basis vector of the underlying space V. So if I can prove it for a simple tensor, I know I can create any tensor out of the basis vectors. So if I prove it for a simple tensor and use a basis vector as my example, I prove it for everything by linearity because you add these things up, multiply them together, and it's as simple as that. So with that in mind, I'm just going to say, well, let's a map. So let's first we start with a map. Our proof begins saying that we have a map from uh, v cross v cross v cross v stool v dual, and that map goes to u. So I'm now going to define a new map, and that new map is going to be c. And here's how I'm going to define c. I'm going to say c. Um, well, uh, uh, let me give an example of this map first. Z operating on, and let's take the, let's make it real simple. Uh, Z operating on, well, V1, V2, V3, W1, W2, right? Let's, that's our map, and that um, is an element of U. So once I have that, in place. I'm going to say, all right, let's imagine, now I know that map exists and it works for all elements of this space. So let's, so if it works for all elements of that tensor product space, it's certainly going to work for E mu, <clears throat> it's going to work for E mu, E nu, E delta, oops, I keep wanting to write tensor products, I don't know why. E alpha, E beta, right? So I'm going to define C. Now C is a map from this tensor product space, which in this case is, I should write, C is a map from T3, 2 to U in our example. So I'm going to write C of any basis vector of that E nu, tensor product E delta, tensor product E alpha, tensor product E beta, right? So C is acting on an element of the 3, 2 uh, tensor product space, and presumably this action should give me an element of U. So I'm going to define C. How do I define C? I can definitely stick in any old basis vector. I could stick in E0, E0, E1, E3, E2, say that's one of the many basis vectors available to me in, in this tensor product space. So I say I stick in that one, and I write, okay, what's the outcome of that result? Well, we're going to define that to be whatever the map Z in question is of the same basis vectors. Right? So in this case, it would be Z, E0, E0, E1, E3, E2. <laughs> like that. Now, the, um, uh, the left side and the right side have different domains. Right? The domain of this side is 
the Cartesian product space here. That's this Cartesian product space. The domain of this size is this tensor product space here. But this is a prescription for how I calculate C. Because I know presumably I know Z. Z is given, right? If this map is given, then this map exists. The way I've discussed the universal property. It goes both ways, by the way. But um, so I'm going to define this map in terms of that map. <clears throat> and but what's important is I've defined this for a basis vector. So once I've defined it for one basis vector, I've now defined it for all basis vectors, and therefore by linearity, because by the way all these maps are linear, I've defined it for every element of this space. So anytime I have a map that takes vectors and covectors uh, in, a, in a, a Cartesian product to uh, some underlying, some, uh, some vector space, which was U in this case, I can always create this map C, which takes the, um, uh, this element of this tensor product space to you. And the reason I'm using U here is because I want, we can think of tensors, you know, that's the same tensor A, we can think of it as a variety of different kinds of maps depending on how you fill in the arguments, how completely you fill in, and in what order you fill in the different argument slots. That's why I have U here. But U could be the real numbers, right? If we're treating, um, you know, if we're, uh, you we, could be the re real numbers is a vector space, so you could be a real number. Okay, so um, this is the universal property. You have this and you're guaranteed that. All right, so now let's consider maps that we know exist. We know that this map exists, and that map takes a uh, a vector and a covector, and it produces a real number. That map definitely it already exists. It exists by definition, right? Because remember, if we went back, we created the vector space V. Remember, I would do this with this little box. V. It was a real vector space. I had as a basis. So, oops, basis and uh, I gave it some dimensionality. It doesn't even matter right now for this argument what the dimension is, but it has some dimensions, right? Dimension of V, whatever that is. Say four, three, doesn't really matter. But um, we know that we use this symbol to create a dual space mapping because as soon as we knew that V existed, canonically, the dual space exists, right? Automatically, because maps between V and R are the only possible mappings, but we can't pick out any one in particular, so we have to pick them all out, so we get v-dual, right? So that definitely exists, and this definitely exists. So if that's the case, because this whole thing just told us that if, if this exists, then this exists, and this is unique, right? The multilinearity and the uniqueness came from the fact that we did this from the basis vectors and that all tensors can be made from the basis vectors and it can only really be done one way because of linearity. So the fact that a map like this exists and this is automatic, if we apply this to the situation here where this is Z, this is a map of a Cartesian product um, into a vector space, in which this case is the simplest one possible, R, we therefore know that there is a map C that takes elements of the 1, 1 tensor product space and gives you elements of R automatically. That map definitely exists, and it exists canonically. Canonically, of course, is the word I'm using to mean it's forced on us. We don't have to make any additional choices about things. It exists no matter what. And with this is so we've added nothing, right? This is still back all the way back to the very basics where we this was all we created. This pops into existence. Once those two pop into existence, all the tensor product spaces pop into existence. And once they pop into existence, the universality rule forces this map to pop into existence. So we always have a map from a Cartesian product space to R and then we get a map from T11 to R also, right? It's automatic. It has to happen. So what this now 
in mind with now R is the simplest of all vector uh, spaces out there. So what if we soup this up a bit? We can imagine uh, without any trouble. Uh, let me just uh, move. Well, we'll leave it here. We can imagine uh, a map from V cross V cross V cross V dual cross. Cartesian product V dual, we can imagine this map to say some other vector space U. And now we want to wonder is given that, what other maps are forced upon us that are similar to this? If I have this thing, uh, if, if this were to exist, is this forced upon us? And, or is there something like this forced upon us? And it's tricky because the only thing that we have that really can operate on, that, that, are, that was forced upon us, is this dual space mapping, right? The dual space mapping exists because we created this underlying vector space. So that's the only tool we really can use to find things that are forced upon us. And specifically what we're going to do is we're going to define the following map Z. Z is going to be a map, let's see, that takes, uh, it's going to be a map from, well, it's going to be a map from V cross V cross V cross V dual cross V dual. Well, I'm using this as an example. What I really want to show is this for it's true for a P Q tensor. In fact, let's go one more dual space. That way I can play around with the... Uh, so in this case, this example is a 3, 3 tensor. But it should be... Think about it in terms of a P, Q tensor, right? It takes that mapping, and what it's going to do is it's going to take that, and it's going to map it into a new vector space. And that vector space is going to be T... 2, 2. Or if you're thinking in terms of PQ, it's T, P minus 1, Q minus 1. And the way that mapping is going to work is it's going to use things that are forced upon us. So I'm actually going to say, well, let's take an example mapping. Um, v, V1, V, Z acting on V1, V2, V3, uh, W1, W2, W3, right? I'm going to say that this thing is going to give us the dual space mapping of W2, V2, and I'm going to leave behind V1, V3, W1, W3. Now notice that if I'm looking for a map that takes this and gives me an element of T22, I've just done it because I've got all these vectors and I take the second dual space uh, covector and the second vector and I execute the dual space mapping, so that's a real number, and then I take what's left and I form a 22 tensor out of it. So this thing here is an element of that, and this is a real number times that, which is also an element of that, uh, element of T22, because it's a, a vector space. So this is a vector space. So I've created a map Z. This is, I've created a map that takes three vectors and three covectors and produces a 2, 2 tensor. Guaranteed. I've done it. But that means, by the universal property, that means there's a map C that takes V1, tensor product V2, Tensor product V3, tensor product V3, tensor product W1, tensor product W2, tensor product W3. I know that there's a map that takes that and all and gives me a 2 2 tensor, and it's going to be the same mapping. It's going to be, um, it's going to give the same value. So it's going to give me W2, V2, V1. V3, W1, W3. I know it exists. So once 
So here's what here's what I've kind of done. I've started by saying, wow, it, wouldn't it be interesting if I had a map that went from this Cartesian product space to that vector space? And then I said, well, you know, I can do that without much trouble, right? I take all of these guys and... I've got to use them all, right, because it's got to be a multi-linear map, right? So I've got to use them all. It's got to be linear and everything. So I can take any pair of, as long as one vector and one covector, I can slap them together in the dual space mapping and get a real number. And then I take the rest and I create a tensor. I'm going to make that. That's my map. And it works perfectly because it is linear. So that's not a problem. And, um, uh... And it is this, it is a mapping, and it's an example of such a mapping, so that's good. And um, once I've, and I'm using things I already have. This must exist. I'm not creating any new uh, pieces to, to the universe, to the mathematical universe. Once I created V, all the tools existed to create Z. Therefore, I know there's a mapping from the 3-3 three, three tensor product space into the 2, 2 tensor product space, and it's the same mapping. So, um, so, I'm, so I now know that maps that can go from 3, 3, and they can go to 2, 2. And without a very little bit of, it, of, um, of imagination, you can see how my 3, 3, uh, my 3, 3, let me make sure I do that here, my 3, 3, um, uh, my 3-3 my three, three tensor that I started with, this one here, that could be a stand-in for any P and Q. As long as I have P and Q, oh, and P and Q has to be, they have to be greater than 1. P and Q both have to be greater than 1. Otherwise, I can't do this dual space mapping here, right? So I need to have, um, I need to pick a number, I, that's greater than 1 but less than P, and J, that's greater than 1, uh, and less than or equal to Q. And the mapping that goes from this object to this object, I have as many cho I have I have different choices of how to choose. In this case I chose two two, right? I chose that I'm going to pair this guy with this guy, pull them out, and create this map. But I could have chosen one one or one three or 3-3, three, three, or 3-2. Three, I could have chosen any of them. So I need a little more specificity in the mapping, and I'll call it I-J, where I have to pick a number I and pick a number J, and in this case, I've really gotten, I've, I've created the map C-2-2. Two, two. But there's, there's going to be P, Q, different possible uh, mappings, but only one of them is going to mimic the one that I've actually created. I just arbitrarily pick 2-2 two, two for Z, so what I was actually looking for was something called C22. Anyway, um, C22 is of the contraction, right? That is what a contraction is. And the reason it's interesting and important is because it is canonical. It was forced upon us. It's not some arbitrary maneuver, right? This mapping exists by the universal property. Because of this universal property, um, which... Uh, um, this universal property here that uh, we've, uh, we showed on this slide, that we showed this map must exist once you pick the ve vector space. Oh, we're, it's not on this slide, I guess. That's on the last slide. But once you pick this vector space, you know that this contraction will exist for these various maps. And this contraction means I can take any tensor product space and I can find these contraction maps based on this rule. And it's not an arbitrary rule. It's, um, it's forced on us. It's, there's, well, it's not arbitrary for two reasons. One, I'm using all of the tools that are already given to me, so I'm not inventing anything new. And also, I'm considering every possible combination of, uh, of, of pairings of which vectors and which covectors to pair. But you'll notice I do need co vectors and covectors. I could not make this work for t, 0, q, right? Because this always has to go from t, p, q to t, p, minus 1, q, minus 1, right? One at a time. Now, I, contract, I can contract 
several at once. So it would go, but if if I did if I contracted several at once and said did omega one or v one or w one v two and w two v one, and then I left over v. Um, I left over V3 tensor product uh, W3 like that. I'm really doing it in two steps. I'm going from PQ to PQ, P minus 1 to P minus 2, P Q minus 2, right? So contraction just will happen stepwise. So we're only really interested in the first one because we can, we, we can do it as many times until P minus N or Q minus N hits 0. So um, uh, so that's what contraction is as far as maps go. Um, if we looked at it in terms of components, um, that's not too hard to do either. So how does it uh, look in the component form? We will, you know, let's just try it. Let's try it for arbitrary P and Q. Let's, let's do it that way, something uh, a little trickier. So we'll say a tensor, is, we'll call it T, and it will be alpha beta, uh, hmm, how should I do this? Let me do this with different indices. Let me do this with numbered indices. So T I 1 I 2 dot 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 I alpha dot 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 to I P. Those are the contravariant um, indices of the tensor T. And then J 1 dot 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 J beta dot 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 j q and then it goes e i one tensor product dot 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 e i alpha tensor product e i p tensor product e j one tensor product dot 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 e j uh, beta tensor product E J Q. Okay, so that is uh, our tensor. So this map C, we're going to take. We're going to find the map C I alpha J beta. Right, I alpha and J beta. So so it could be say for example, if you took this literally, uh, this might be. Uh, I alpha would be 3 and beta would be 2, so it would be 3, 2 if you ignore these these little dot, dot, dots, right? These, uh, what do they call ellipses. If you ignored those things, um, I guess you need 3 to be an ellipsis. Um, if you uh, ignored those, then this would be C, uh, 3, 2. And if you ignored those, this would be a 1, 2, 3, 4, a rank 4, 3 tensor, right? And... Uh, this is the basis vectors, these are all Einstein sums, it's the usual thing. <clears throat> so this guy has to be a map from T, P, Q to the tensor product stays P minus 1, Q minus 1, and that map is defined by, um, it's defined by uh, well, it's defined by this. It's defined by essentially this this rule here, but um, here I've made it specifically. Uh, uh, in this case, I made it two two, right? We made this two two map. So now we're going to make it the the i alpha j beta map. And so, what is that going to be? Well, remember everything is linear. So this is going to end up being uh, uh, C I alpha J beta acting on, it's going to act on this large thing that we have up here, which I'll copy, and so it's acting on this guy. Let's see if I can even shrink it down a little bit there. Well, look at that. So this thing acts on that. Right. I'll erase that. So it acts on that, and um, that action is going to be T 
I1, IP, J1, JQ, and it's going to go E, J, beta, dual space mapping to E, I, alpha, and then what's left over is going to be this without these two guys, right? We're going to omit those two. And so the dual space mapping will then be E I 1 tensor product E I or E I alpha omitted. Put the upside down thing there for omitted. E I P tensor product E J 1 dot 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 E J beta omitted dot 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 E J Q and then this is meant to be uh, this guy multiplied by that guy like that and so this is the result is the result of this CIJ mapping this is the result of the contraction right this is the result of the contraction but what is this that's just the delta function right that's just delta j beta i alpha. So that means that this thing equals t i1, and we'll call it um, uh, i alpha i p, and then it's going to be j1 dot 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 i alpha j q. So this forces the two indices to be the same, so I've decided to change the J beta to an I alpha. And now you see, and then of course, this guy here will just repeat itself right down here. Um, and, uh, well, actually, you know what, let me, let me make that cleaner, right? This will just be E I 1. Well, no, I need, I need, to, I need to literally duplicate it because, um, uh, so this goes down here, right, the same way because I need to have the string that explicitly says I alpha and J beta are eliminated, so I can't clean it up. It is clean. It's as clean as it can get. The only thing that's cleaning up is getting rid of this delta function by making this index and that index the same. And that ultimately is the index gymnastics version of what a contraction is, right? Because in, contra in index gymnastics, well, let me talk about index gymnastics in a moment, but the point I'm getting to is that... Uh, the notion of contraction is actually forced on us. It's forced on us by inventing the vector space, getting the dual space, the dual space mapping exists by definition, and this universal property, it's this universal property that tells us if this kind of map exists, then this kind of map exists. And then once we broker that universal property into... Uh, all the tensor product spaces, what we realize is we're looking for maps that force us to take PQ tensors and get P minus 1, Q minus 1 tensors by following this prescription right here. Um, and that is ultimately how uh, contraction works. But now I want to talk about um, index gymnastics, right? Now that we have contraction down, uh, index gymnastics is sort of the friendly word for um, all of the classical manipulations of tensors. So if you live in a world where you forget about basis vectors and you only think of tensors as their components, where that now is a uh, co we, we, that would be a contravariant tensor, whereas we would think of it like this, and we would just think of it as a tensor or a member of the vector space, in the classical world of this material, um, you only think of it as terms of its components, right? And so index gymnastics is really this how you play around with these components, not play, I guess play around is probably not the right way to say it, how you um, manipulate and control these components to be completely legitimate in, um, and, and not introduce any errors. And what you're basically doing is when we, you move these, compo these indices around, say up and down or, or eliminate indices that were there, you're moving from one vector space to another vector space to another vector space, right? And we know what these vector spaces are, right? 
we know that you can have v to v dual. That is one type of movement, but you can also have the tensor product of v and v dual, and you can move to v, right? We know that <clears throat> moving between these vector spaces is possible, and index gymnastics is just a way of understanding all of these motions, but never looking at the basis vectors, only looking at the components, right? That's what's called index gymnastics. So the most famous and most important of all the index gymnastics is raising and lowering indices. So if I have uh, a contra, they, what they would say in the classical world, a contravariant vector, which to me is a, remember, is to me that is a vector, an element of the vector space, where the basis vectors are covariant, but the components are contravariant, but they don't see that, so they call it a contravariant vector vector. But if I want to take a contravariant vector and create a covariant vector, index gymnastics wise I do it the following way. I say g nu mu a mu and that equals by definition a nu. Right? So I do this Einstein sum on the, uh, and that's the, the most important of all index gymnastics steps. Um, the uh, contrary step is g nu mu a nu equals a mu. Now when you do this, it's generally polite to keep the Einstein summed uh, indices closest together as possible, right? So you would write it this way, not this way. Um, and you can do that, of course, because the metric tensor in most studies is symmetric, right? So these two rarely represent the same thing. So it doesn't really matter which way you write it, but um, it's always nice to have um, this these these summed indexes pretty close together. So that index gymnastics step, how would we interpret that? How would we interpret that using our work? We would say a mu e mu, right? And then we would essentially, um, we're going to feed that to g nu mu e nu tensor product e mu, right? So remember, this thing is looking for two, two. Uh, vectors to eat and give a real number. But you're not going to give it two vectors. You're only going to give it one vector. And <clears throat> we're going to put it in uh, the second... We're going to put it in um, the uh, second slot. Oops, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to write this correctly. Sorry, sorry. New alpha E alpha. And we're going to put this guy in the second slot, a mu e mu, like that. And the this thing is going to end up being a mu by linearity, g nu alpha. So by linearity, the a just comes out in front. And then what's left behind is e nu. And then it's the dual space mapping of e alpha on e mu. And, of course, that dual space mapping just gives you the delta function alpha mu. So, um, so you switch this to uh, a mu g nu mu, like that. Uh, I probably should have uh, put the a over here to have the nice uh, index ordering like, like that. And that's the origin of this, right? I've just shown you the origin. All the origin of this is we've just taken a instance of the metric tensor and fed it this our our uh, fed it our vector. And of course, what's left is something that's waiting for a covector, right? Something that's wait. I'm um, I'm sorry. Something that's waiting for a vector to get a real number. Well, what's wait? What waits around for a vector to feed to feed it and give it a real number? Well covector, and that's what this is. This is a covector. Um, uh, ultimately, if we stuck with uh, 
if we stuck with my prescription all the way to the end, which is probably what I should do because otherwise what's the point of demonstrating it, then I would end up with an E new here, right? Now, this is the final thing in our world where we keep the basis vectors with us. But in the classical world, they peel the basis vector off, and this is all they show you. And that now they redefine as a new, right? And that's not a problem. We would tend to do that as well, right? Um, and this, this is, we sometimes say we're contracting over this mu, but that's not really true. Contraction, uh, well, it, it is and it isn't true, right? It's, if we redefine this whole thing as t nu mu mu, then it's a contraction, right? It's a, it's an, it's, it's a contraction just like we learned over here on, on this page, right? Where we set two of the indices equal. So, you could think of it as a contraction. So I guess the word contraction is fine. But uh, usually when we think of contractions, we think of contractions within the same tensor structure. The point is this really is a single tensor structure, right? Um, it's three indices multiplied together, which I guess is worthy of, of, of reminding ourselves. The tensor product also, um, a mu b nu, Index gymnastics allows us to write that as t mu nu. And, well, what's going on there? Well, in our world, it's a mu e mu. Tensor product, b nu e nu. That's what, in index gymnastics world, that's what this would be. In our world, now through linearity, we go a mu b nu e mu tensor product e nu, and then we just rename this thing. That's just a product of two numbers, so it's a number, <clears throat> but it is a number that depends that has two indices with it, so we just rename it t mu nu e mu e nu, and then in the classical world we peel this off and we just call it t mu nu. So that's the that's sort of the uh, index gymnastics of multiplying two contravariant tensors together, and you can see how this is exactly the same for a mu b nu, like that, or a mu b nu. It's the same process. So that's like the second most important, well, it's probably the first most important. Actually, this is a little more fundamental even than the raising and lowering we just did. So um, the tensor product, when you take tensors and you just multiply them together, what you're actually doing is you're doing a tensor product of two tensors. So it looks like Standard multiplication is only standard multiplication because of the linearity of tensors and the fact that you're multiplying components which are real numbers. So, um, and the, the final tensor product space you land in, you have to retain the order because that now the problem is, is if I write B mu A nu, right, um, that's that's actually still okay because that's going to uh, it, you're still going to be in the same tensor product space. The the ambiguity ambiguity might be if I did b new uh, say I did b new a mu and I want to write t new mu. Well, these two things are real numbers in the the component world. So that is actually equal to a mu b nu. So now my question is, is what about, how do I know it's not t nu, how, how do I know it's not that? These two things are different, right? One belongs to the, um, uh, one belongs to the t11 tensor product space. The other one belongs to a rank, a, another one one like space, but instead of vector v v, v star, well, instead of being v tensor product v star, it's actually v star tensor product v, right? And it's the uh, it's the opposite, right? It, these are two different tensor product spaces. One of them we actually call a tensor space because we're using that convention, and the other we don't. But they're still both totally legitimate. The point is there's some ambiguity when you're, when you're doing that, so you have to be careful about that. Um, 
So you've got to uh, uh, you've got to keep track of what tensor product space you're living in. And the way you keep track of that is um, uh, you've got to kind of dive back into this thing. I think you've got to really know what where that tensor product is and what's on what side and what's on the other. That way you'd never screw it up. You'd always write A mu E mu tensor product B new e new like that and you know it's the vector f space first the tensor product space second all right so that's sort of the other piece of index gymnastics what other index gymnastics are there well the next one of course is contraction right so phi of t alpha beta gamma delta epsilon eta and i want to contract over any two indices i just set the indices to be the same so it would be T alpha, beta, gamma, say, uh, alpha, epsilon, eta. And that will end up being a tensor, call it M, beta, gamma, epsilon, eta. So the contraction allows me to write a new tensor where I have eliminated um, uh, the summed over index, right? That's the gymnastic step. You just eliminate the summed over index and what's left behind is your new tensor. Now, I've already kind of gone through how that is done. In, that's actually the hardest one to understand in the component world, but the result, right, is always going to be um, a member of P minus one, Q minus one. And you can't do this if you start with T alpha beta gamma you can't contract anything. Now you could, you could do G, um, say mu alpha T alpha beta gamma, and that would give you T mu alpha beta gamma, and then you could contract and get T alpha alpha beta gamma. Now that this contraction, it's not, you know, you're, you're creating a new tensor, right? And this would be M beta gamma. You're creating a new tensor M beta gamma because remember this guy here is in a 1, 3 uh, tensor product space and this guy here is in a 0, 2 tensor product space. P minus 1, Q minus 1. So, um, but uh, uh, what we saw how that worked. We saw how that worked on the previous previous chart and um, uh, that's the other important, see if there's any other important in, index gymnastics things that uh, I want to show. Yeah, I guess uh, the squared length of a vector, if you have a metric and we have, if this is our vector in our language and in the language of the classics, it's this uh, component, um, the squared length of the vector, I would feed it to, uh, feed it to, uh, itself. Basically, I want to multiply it by its covariant form and uh, contract, right? So I would take a mu, a mu, and that's a contraction, leaving us with nothing but the a single number. Uh, I might call that single number maybe the magnitude of a. And, um, or actually, it should be uh, uh, actually the magnitude of a squared. And the way that would work in our our world is it's the magnitude of a vector a mu a mu would be a mu e um, mu and then g uh, mu alpha a alpha e e what e what e mu, which is then a mu, a mu, and, uh, wait, 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 what am I, what am I doing? This is crazy. That's not, that's not right. Sorry, 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 sorry. The magnitude, it's pretty easy, right? It's g mu new being fed a alpha e alpha a 
beta e beta, which equals a alpha a beta g mu nu, and then it is um, uh, e mu e alpha e nu e beta. So these become delta mu alpha delta nu beta, and you end up with a alpha a beta g alpha beta, and then this part becomes a alpha a alpha, right? And that's what we call uh, magnitude of a squared. Okay, so that's another index gymnastics trick. So the index gymnastics in the classical sense is a alpha a alpha, or sometimes they'll, sometimes they'll just do a alpha a beta g uh, beta alpha. Sometimes they'll do it that way, uh, but they're both identical, right? Because we've already learned the index gymnastics of lowering, right? So this is what we call the magnitude of a vector. So that's the index gymnastics for the magnitude of a vector. Actually, that's really the most important ones. I guess there's a couple others that... There's this little symbol for anti-symmetry. Um, that's probably worth knowing that uh, if I do this, if I say F alpha beta... So say there's a tensor, a two, uh, 0, 2 tensor, F alpha beta, right? then this thing is actually equal to one-half of f alpha beta minus f beta alpha. And that's called the, uh, the, the totally anti-symmetric part of f. Likewise, I can create f, and I think I use brackets or braces, f alpha, oops, X F alpha beta in braces, and that's F alpha beta plus F beta alpha, and that's the totally symmetric part of F. And F is going to equal the anti-symmetric part, alpha beta plus F alpha beta, plus the symmetric part. So there, that counts as index gymnastics. It's more of a notation about a process to anti-symmetrize, but um, uh, we won't discuss the anti-symmetrization of tensors until a later section on forms. But uh, no discussion of index gymnastics would be complete if I didn't mention that there's this index notation to symmetrize or, or symmetrize or anti-symmetrize a tensor. And you're not really symmetrizing or anti-symmetrizing the tensor. What you're doing is you're extracting, you're separating it into an anti-symmetric piece and a symmetric piece. You're actually throwing away information, right? Here you're throwing away all the anti-symmetric information. Here you're throwing away all the symmetric information. And you need them both to reproduce the actual tensor. So you are creating something lesser, in a sense, when you, when you do this process. Okay, so I think that's enough. Well, that's a, re a redo of the um, index gymnastics lesson with a little bit more of a focus on, on contraction. I'll probably uh, replace that lesson with that old version of the lesson with this one.